I'd like to welcome you to the service this evening. Uh, my name's John. I'm the pastor of the church. Uh, and the church, Bearsden Baptist Church, would, would just love to give you a really warm welcome to tonight's service, which is a service of ordination for John Burns. It kind of coincides more or less with his uh, for full accreditation of the Baptist Union as well, although I don't think that's specifically what we're thinking about so much as his ordination as a minister of the gospel. But the two kind of go hand in hand. Uh, and that second part will be happening in a couple of weeks at the Baptist Union Assembly in Motherwell. So you are most welcome. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to the band who are going to lead our opening worship. Uh, when the service finishes a little bit later, you're most welcome to stay and have some refreshments afterwards and uh, celebrate, chat, uh, congratulate John and Jill, because I'm sure she's had a big part to play in this process of John coming here tonight for this ordination. Um, so speak to both of them. I'm sure you will. So let's pray just as we open our service tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence here with us uh, in our service tonight. It's a special service for John and for Jill. Uh, they've been on a journey together over uh, a number of years from uh, the early days in Ayrshire and in Ayr. And uh, Lord, their journey has brought them here tonight to celebrate as we uh, ordain, <coughs> ordain John as a Baptist minister in the Baptist Union of Scotland. Uh, we just pray for your presence with us. We pray that Jesus would be glorified in all that's done, all that's said, uh, the stories we hear about the journey uh, that John and Jill have taken to come here uh, to this point. Uh, and we pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for leading us in worship, and it's uh, great to be here in the Lord's presence, and I'm so glad to be with you. So my name is Martin Hodson. I'm a member of the national team of the Baptist Union of Scotland, which, if you're not sure, is the network of 162 churches around the country, of which Bursden Baptist Church is an important part. And it's a real privilege to have chance to lead this occasion when we recognize that God has ordained John to the work of ministry. Now, that isn't something that just happens tonight. This is kind of the culmination of a journey because in, in, our, in our network of churches, when a person believes that God has called them to ministry, they meet with what we call the board of ministry, representatives from about 20 different Baptist churches around the country. And they seek to discern if a person has a call that has its origin in God and that they have a suitable character for ministry, an appropriate gifts for ministry, an appropriate training for ministry, and a passion for God that's necessary, necessary for ministry. Now, the great news is that John came to the board of ministry quite a few years ago, and they discerned very clearly that God had his hand on his life and called him to ministry. Well, normally what happens is you then begin a three-year period that's called pre-accreditation. Uh, but John just kind of played around with that a little bit and intercalated a few other years of youth work and then was called here to Bear's Den and formally worked through a three-year period that involves uh, further formation for ministry through workshops and conferences and reflection on practice and retreat days and very importantly having a mentor and John has uh, successfully enthusiastically and wisely completed that journey which is what makes it appropriate for us to hold this ordination service this evening and as you've heard in a couple of weeks at the Baptist Assembly recognize his accreditation by our Union of Churches. So what we're going to do in the next few minutes is um, um, I will just say a few introductory words about ordination, and then we'll hear some testimonies. We'll hear from John how God led him to recognize this call and to this point. Then we'll hear from Craig on behalf of the church um, about how the church has recognized this call to ordain ministry. And then Mark Bentham, who's been John's mentor, will come and share a testimony of his experience of working closely with John. Then John will make some promises, and then I will ask you also to make a promise. And then we'll gather around John for the laying on of hands and prayer. So that's where we're going to go in the next few minutes. So, John, would you like to come and join me at the front here?
good to be standing beside you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel that I've got to know you reasonably well during these uh, pre-accredited years, and mm. we spent quite a bit of time together in different training and learning environments, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, it's been good. Yes, yeah, so it's been good, yeah. hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, listen to these words about ministry. All God's people are called to ministry. Everyone who has been baptised into Jesus Christ uh, is called to serve him and one another in the fellowship of the church, wherever we go, and in all that we do. But God calls some people to servant leadership among his people, to devote themselves especially to prayer and the word of God, to better equip God's people for the life of discipleship in the world. These people we appoint and release into that calling with prayer and with the laying on of hands, with our blessing. We respect their role among us as ministers, examples and leaders. We consider them ordained to this ministry. So today we're affirming God's call on you, John. Recognising you as a minister ordained by God for, to the service of his church and accredited by our Baptist Union. So let's hear from you a little bit about how God has led you to this point. Smash it. I have notes. Wow. My wife made sure that I had some notes for this because I have a tendency to waffle and speak for far too long. So... Um, Thank you for that introduction, Martin. Successful, enthusiastic, and wise. Yeah. You heard it here first. <laughs> Bear that in mind, everyone. So I first really sensed a, a call from God in my life back when I was 16. I was on a mission trip with our church that I grew up in, Riverside Evangelical, down in Ayr. And as I went out and served God and saw him making an impact in people's lives, I first began to sense that there may be a call from God that that might be what I was meant to do with my life, to follow him and to serve him in some form of ministry. I'm really grateful. Um, there's a few folks, my parents included, from uh, Riverside are here tonight. And that was a church that really developed and, and gave a huge amount of opportunity to me. They allowed me to preach for the first time when I was 16, uh, a dangerous thing to do. Potentially that's still the case, I don't know. And they gave me a lot of opportunity and they helped me to develop and to grow in spite of perhaps my immaturity and the points where I would make mistakes, they invested in me because they saw that potential. And so I served within Riverside and a local youth work project called The Ark, which was a, a kind of ecumenical youth work project within which I met Gillian, my wife. Indeed. Yes, absolutely. Um, who, who wanted me to share with you that she is just here for the cake and the tea afterwards. <clears throat> But yeah, and together we, we got married and moved to Air Baptist Church. And at that point, I was going into my studies with the Baptist College. And Mark Bentham, who's been my uh, mentor through the pre-accredited process, was actually the pastor of Air Baptist at that point. So poor Mark has had to put up with me really since back in about 2008. Uh, it's a long time that he's had to deal with me. And he's, yes, you are going a little bit grey over the years. I'm sure that was nothing to do with me. Yeah. And so I spent time in the college, growing, developing, and then, as Martin was saying, went out and served in youth work in a few different capacities before I ended up here in Bears Den. And it's just over three, three and a bit years ago, three and a half years ago, I guess, when I was first applying for the job here. At that point, I'd been out of ministry for a few months and was really seeking and prayerfully considering, with a little bit, to be honest, of anxiety and trepidation, what the next step might be. And I'd come back into the Baptist Union. I'd been along at the assembly that year and I'd been in touch with Bearsden Baptist and started going through that process. And I shared with Jim Purvis, one of the other members of the national team recently, that coming along here and getting involved really just felt like home. Um, the, the church here were very welcoming of me. They, again, have continued to develop me and give me lots of opportunity. And it has been so wonderful and so exciting to see our young people uh, through my, my role growing and developing, seeing some of them getting baptized, some of them getting the opportunity to preach and lead worship and do these kind of things at a young age in the same way that I was given that opportunity. Because really that's a huge part of what my call and what I believe God has called me to is, 
It's giving that opportunity and mentoring and developing people into the gifts that God has given them. Um, so that gives you a little bit of the story of how I came to, to be where I am today. Um, I also just wanted to say thank you so much for, for being here, uh, folks from Bears Den and from various other previous walks of life, friends and family and parts of other churches I've been involved in. Um, it's really great to see so many faces here tonight, and I thank you for all of your prayers and support. Thank you, John. Thanks. If you'd like to stay up here on the platform with us, um, this church that has welcomed you warmly and given you continuing opportunities to develop, the place where you've served, particularly in youth ministry, but in other ways, has been vital to the story of the outworking of God's call. And so I'm going to ask Craig Donnelly if he'd like to come and just say a few words on behalf of the church and how you've seen and recognized God's call. Thanks. So... John messaged me, or actually we were messaging, and John messaged me and, and said that uh, Martin had said, could somebody from the church do a little bit about uh, John's call and, and how that works out in, in the church here at Bearsden Baptist Church? Um, quite late in the day, I might say. Um, but no, I know. And it's, it's not like I ever fully prepare unless I preach anyway. So, um, interestingly, um, I, I wasn't entirely sure what I would say when I stood up here. So I, I, I spent the last um, couple of days on and off looking to see what the Bible says about having a calling. Um, and it's really interesting because actually I found out there are very few instances of a very specific call in the Bible. There's lots of general call. There's lots of, you know, what God calls us to be, who God calls us to be, to him, to love him. And there are general calls for us to work and to do various activities, which we all know about if we read the Bible. But in terms of specific call, there's very few, only a handful. I'm going to say maybe five, something like that. Which is, if you reflect on how the, the Bible relates to our everyday life, might suggest that people in everyday life having a specific call may actually be quite a rare thing. And as John's just told you, John very much has a very specific call. Um, so, so maybe John is a rare thing. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave that out there. <laughs> this is where I drop the mic and run away. Um, but I actually think that that's, it's worth pointing out. that The fact that John is here with a very specific call is very important in terms of who John has been to us, to the role John has played within the church. Um, I thought I might just very quickly tell you the other side of the, the hiring story. So, you know, for, j just for the sake of, of squaring the circle, as they would say in my line of work. Um, about three and a half years ago, we were in the, the position of, of wanting to hire uh, a new youth worker. We've been very lucky, very blessed in the past with, with good youth work. It's been a central part of what the church is about. Um, but three and a half years ago, we were at, w without a youth worker, um, and we brought a bunch of candidates in here. I think about the people who were on the panel, about six people, eight people, six people, something like that. Uh, we sat them at a table over there and subjected them to a panel interview with uh, four people, which, you know, we did our best to make it comfortable, but it's a panel interview with four people. And it's fair to say that when John came along, you weren't wearing a blazer jacket that day. We interviewed John. We liked John. John was our lead candidate, but you know, we weren't sure. That, that's where we were. So what we did was we invited John back. Um, we also, on the, on, we didn't just do a panel interview. We, we subjected them to some of the young people. We let the young people loose on, on, the, on the candidates as well. Um, and, and, you know, we just weren't 100%. So we, we took an extra step, we took a, a, just an extra bit of time and we invited John along to come and do one of the, the um, evening sessions with the young people. Um, and I have to say that when John came along to do the evening session with the young people, um, he was quite bold. Um, he, he, we asked him to come and do a little short piece of Bible teaching. Um, and can you remember what you chose? Yeah. yeah? So it was, um, I actually can't remember the specific piece, it was, it was Old Testament, which was, uh, yeah, there you go. So nice light material, easy theology. 
And he, and he did it with a kind of semi-drama-y type piece, I seem to recall. Yeah. But when John came and, and did that session, um, it was very clear to all of us who were involved in the interviewing that you know, here was a creature in his natural environment. Um, you know, so I think the call was very clear to us at that point. Um, John has spoken multiple times in this church, and I'm sure to, to many, if not most, of the people who are here to support him about this specific call on his life to ministry, but also this specific call right now to uh, youth and young people and the, and the youth work around that. And that's been very clear to us here in Bears Den. Um, I think, you know, the, the um, quality that John has brought to that, the biblical truth that John has brought to that, this extra level of um, training, um, this extra level of scrutiny that he's brought to the youth work here, really has up the game within the church in terms of our young people. Um, and, and I think you can see that through the, the growth um, of the young people from the activities that the young people are getting involved with. And, and really, um, I've watched John over the past three years or so really grow to become a key leader within this church. Um, I'm incredibly blessed to get to, to do a little bit of testimony on behalf of the church. And I think... Um, I just want to reflect again on that specific call which John's really brought out. That's terrific. Thanks very much, Craig. Thank you. And let's hear one other voice. I'll ask Mark if you'd like to come and join us as someone who... We want you to speak particularly as someone who's been Mark's mentor, uh, John's mentor in recent times, but obviously your connection goes back so much further. He's been my, me he's been my mentor too in many respects. I was thinking that uh, today's unique. Not only have you managed to fill this place in competition with Strictly, but, but it's unique in the fact that you uh, will have the claim of fame of having your ordination on the only Saturday when Parliament has sat in 30 years. <laughs> but in there is a picture for me of John and Jill too. And that is bringing the gospel to the reality of life. I first met John and Jill whenever they appeared uh, one time at uh, Bearsden at Bearsden Baptist. Yes, it was at, it was Air Baptist, not Bearsden Baptist. At Air Baptist, wanting to start something called Fire Starters, and that was to be a ministry that uh, would reach out to younger people and help disciple them. I think, from memory, you wanted to sleep over in the church uh, periodically uh, through the year and uh, get to know young people and benefit, benefit them. And that was something that got started, got going, and, and worked well, um, and fed into a number of lives. And in fact, over the years, you have uh, opened up friendships through that, and uh, various other uh, avenues have opened up with that. You then came back to wear Baptist, as you said, and no, you weren't wearing a jacket. Yeah, yeah, you were. I, I put a jacket on especially tonight, um, you know, just to, to match you. You weren't wearing a jacket. I think you were probably wearing shorts at the time. And uh, to have someone of John's ilk come into our congregation, to become part of the church uh, in a radical way in some respects, but then to lead worship wearing shorts was challenging for some. But that's where reality is at times. And John and Jill bringing the reality of the gospel to the reality of life and challenging people's tradition. And I've appreciated you much for that over the years. We've um, debriefed often how you have to bring people with you. And we got to the point where you kind of started to appreciate that. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, have I touched on something? <laughs> but nevertheless, there's no doubting your calling whatsoever. Never was. No doubting the desire in both your lives to bring the reality of the gospel to the reality of life. And I can warmly commend you as someone who has watched over you and benefited greatly from that. God bless. Thank you, Mark.
John, I'm going to ask you some questions. These questions are not spoken casually. These are part of what we might dare to call a covenant, a solemn agreement or solemn promises. You've seen these questions. They're not coming out of the blue. You've had time to think and pray over them and reflect on the significance of them for tonight. John, you can only fulfill the ministry to which you are being set apart in humble dependence on God, sincerity of purpose, and holiness of life. We invite you to declare your faith in Christ and acceptance of this ministry in the presence of God before these representatives of his people by answering these questions. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? I do. This is the God in whom I trust. Jesus said the greatest among you must be the servant of all. Do you believe you were called by God to servant leadership in our Baptist network of churches? I believe that God has called me. Jesus commissioned us to preach the good news and make disciples everywhere. Will you proclaim that good news through word and deed, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, making disciples and seeking the coming kingdom of God? As a disciple of Jesus Christ... I will call others to follow him. Jesus said, feed my sheep. In your ministry, will you be diligent in your study of scripture and play your part in the nourishment and nurture of the flock of God? Trusting the Lord as my shepherd, I will. Jesus taught his disciples to pray and not give up. Will you be constant in encouraging God's people in prayer and cultivating a life of prayer yourself. By God's grace, I will. Jesus challenged his disciples to leave self behind, to take up their cross and to follow after him. Are you determined to walk this path, even though you do not know where it leads? With the Lord's help, I am. Your ordination is as a minister accredited by the Baptist Union of Scotland, let me read to you our Declaration of Principle, which describes our shared core convictions. And then I'm going to invite you to affirm these are your beliefs. Our Scottish Baptist Declaration of Principle says, and there are three things, that the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God and Saviour, is the sole and absolute authority in all matters pertaining to faith and practice, as revealed in the Holy Scriptures, and that each church has liberty under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to interpret and administer his laws. That Christian baptism is the immersion in water into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of those who have professed repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose the third day, and that it is the duty of every disciple to bear witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to take part in the evangelization of the world. John, are you in wholehearted agreement with this statement? I am. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask all of us here a question and... I would ask you to respond if you are able. We do. This is your taking part in the discerning and the testimony that God is ordaining John to ministry. So would you stand, please? And if you are able, respond, we do. As members of this church, John's previous churches, and as friends gathered to support him today, do you believe that God has called him to Christian ministry? And do you acknowledge him as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ? We do. Thank you. <laughs> it's encouraging, isn't it? What a great thing to know that other people recognize that in you. If you would like to be seated then, and we're going to now lay hands on John and pray for the power and the anointing of God to be on him in his continuing ministry as we recognize this as ordained by God. So um, we've asked uh, four people, Mark and John and uh, Jill and Craig to come. Do you perhaps want to stand in the center for this? That might make it a little easier. And uh... we will, uh, we'll 
we'll lay hands on you, John, and each of us will pray and uh, commend you to the Lord. So let's pray to God. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brother, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for, for John and for Jill. Lord, I thank you that he's come into this place, and he's made a home for himself. And this has been a home that he can make for himself. Lord, thank you that he's been a friend and a mentor and a teacher. And Lord, I thank you that he's been among us and grown in stature with you and in stature with us. Lord, I just pray that you'll pour out your blessing on him, that you'll continue to pour your blessing on him, and that you'll continue to help him grow in you as he leads us forward. Lord Jesus, just bless him and keep him. In your precious name. Amen. Thank you, Lord God, for a man who has experienced the reality of life, sometimes in a raw way, uh, but brings the gospel to that reality, and so is able to bring that yet again to other people. We recognize the call in his life as outworked in so many ways as we've already rehearsed tonight. And we seek your blessing upon he and Jill as they just breathe almost now after a long process, but with your, by your grace, move on to other things, we pray, and be involved in people's lives in such a way that is not only a blessing, but is a blessing and honor to God Almighty. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Martin said earlier that this is the culmination of a journey, but we also recognize, too, that it's a step, a stage in a bigger journey that continues on from today. Uh, at the moment, John is called to be the youth pastor here in Bearsden Baptist Church, and we certainly believe that you have good plans and purposes for him uh, from this stage onwards, whatever those will ultimately look like. And uh, we just pray for him that he would be like Abraham, open to your call and listening uh, like uh, Elijah to the still small voice that comes at different moments. Lord, there will be ups and downs along the way. There will be harder days and easier days, uh, times when it may just be the call that you have given him that keeps him going. Uh, we just pray a blessing on him and on Jill uh, as they navigate uh, that path, uh, as they navigate the ups and downs, uh, as they experience and grow in their faith in you through all of these. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we do thank you for John and for Jill. Father, we thank you for the gifts and talents that you have given them and for the way in which he is listening to you and being guided by you and developing those gifts and talents. And I'd just like to read uh, this scripture over you as uh, <clears throat> God's word to you tonight from Colossians chapter 1. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power, so you will have all the endurance and patience you need May you be filled with joy 
always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. Amen. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come upon John, that you will empower and equip and enable him for the ministry that lies ahead. Holy Spirit, testify in his heart that he is your child. Let him cry daily, Abba, Father. Come upon him that his life will bear the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and humility. Come upon him in power that he will be your witness in all that he does, that he will fiercely, de fearlessly declare Jesus is Lord in every situation. Holy Spirit, make him one who dreams dreams and sees visions of what is not yet and what can be by faith. Holy Spirit, rest upon our brother John. Equip him for every act of service that you have called him to do for the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. So, John... So, John, I'm here. <laughs> having heard testimony of God's call on your life, having witnessed and taken part in the solemn promises, having now laid hands upon you and prayed for you at the start of or the, this stage in this ministry, so it is my privilege to declare on behalf of this congregation, our network of Baptist churches, the whole church of Jesus Christ, that God has ordained you to the work of ministry. Those whom God calls, he equips. May you be strengthened in him. Amen. Um, let's then listen to the word of God and a word that's been prepared for this occasion. Ron is with us this evening and uh, Ron, we look forward to you opening the scriptures for us. Moses, Moses, here I am. Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am sending you, Moses, to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. 
Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. We could look at an event like today and simply consider this in the way that sometimes we consider this passage of Moses' own call. We could consider this a call to obedience, a call for someone to go and do the thing that they were told to do. We could take that information and port that onto our own very lives. If you are called by God to do something, then you better go and do it. We could port that into the lives of those that we see around us, those that we know from churches, those whom we know God has placed something special on. If God has told you to do this, then you better go and do this. We could say that blessing comes from obedience. But I put it to you that the call that Moses received in this passage was far beyond any normal call that is placed on our life. I mean, come on, this is a guy who has a st -t 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 daughter, who needs someone to help him speak, a man who is called to go to a place that he fled from, to go back to a family that he left behind in fear, in cowardice, a man who is told to go back to an Egyptian nation who will surely reject him because he murdered one of their own. To go back to the Israelite nation who will surely reject him because he was one of them but not. And to take 605,330 people, by the way, that's about 11% of the population of Scotland, out of bondage, a people with no governance, a people with no structure, a people who have never existed outside of the slavery that they have only known throughout all of their lives, through generations and through generations and through generations. He is told to go and take them out, to wander through the desert and to bring them into a new place to be able to form a country, I put it to you that the calls that you and I and maybe even John has had on his life do not mirror this call. This call is frankly ridiculous. And so for those of you that question the obedience of Moses, would you have gone Would you have done something that crazy? God obviously knows the doubt that's in Moses' mind. And he chooses to answer him or at least answer that question in a very specific way. Did you hear what he said when he encourages Moses? And indeed, when Moses questions what he is going to go and say to his own people, his own people who he knows but doesn't really know, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. It must have meant something to him. Because on the basis of saying simply that, on the basis of saying simply what God's name is, is enough to convince Moses to go and do something ridiculous. What does it mean? Maybe we need to look and see, frankly, what it means to be the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. What is that saying? What is that promise? What is that name? 
The Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great name and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Genesis 12, 1 to 3, the God of Abraham. Stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and I will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all of these lands and will confirm the earth I swore to your father, Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and I will give them all these lands and through your offering, all offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, keeping my decrees and my instructions. Genesis 26, 3-4, the God of Isaac. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Genesis 28, 14 to 15, the God of Jacob. The God of your fathers the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. God takes Moses out of the position that he's in. The adopted Midianite, the adopted prince son of an Egyptian queen, the lost son of an Israelite woman, God takes his story, which has orbited so many different realities and so many different places, and he now anchors it. He puts it into the ground. You think you know who you are, Moses? You don't, but you soon will. I am your God. I am the God of your father. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. Your story belongs to me. Your history, which you think has moved around so many different places, is not a sojourness as you think. You are grounded. You are committed. You are a part of something greater than yourself. God turns to Moses and says to him, you see this massive thing that I'm asking you to do? Well, I am here to tell you that you are a part of something massive. You are a part of my promise. You are a part of my call. You are a part of the faithful word that I have said for generation and generation over the people that you originally belong to, that I will stay faithful to them, that I will take them out of bondage and that I will place them somewhere new. Your story is not your own story. Your story is this story. It's bigger than you could ever imagine. And for the fallen Egyptian prince whose inspiration an expectation of power has only come through the magician and magical expectations of alabaster stone and golden paintings and hieroglyphics contained within a palace. He is dragged out of that story and placed somewhere new, grounded, founded, never to be moved. God calls on Moses to do something incredible. He says to Moses, remember. Remember. Remember me. Remember what I have done. Remember those things that your mother told you when you thought she was just your nanny. 
Remember those stories that you heard from the Israelites who were slaves. Remember the miracles. Remember the creation. Remember the pulling from one place to another. Remember the fact that I don't go anywhere. Remember the fact that I am always with you. Remember the fact that I listen. Remember the fact that I perform miracles. Remember the things that I did for Noah. Remember the things that I did for Abraham. Remember the things that I did in the midst of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember. Remember me. Remember me new. Remember me fresh. And don't remember me just to yourself, but remember me to them. If those Israelites that you go to now need a reminder of who I am and who you are, then tell them the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent you. Remember. Remember. And if your story feels too big, if it feels too onerous, if it feels beyond what you can manage, if it feels like where you stand is in front of an insurmountable mountain, remember this place that you are at right now because that mountain that seems too big to cross over is the mountain that the people will worship at. Remember. And remember me to them. For as long as they have been sucking and breathing and sweating in the mud and the dust and the sand that they have been crying out for someone to come and to save them, that they have been waiting there for me to go, remember me to them, remember all the promises to them, remember that they are the ones that I have called and do something special. Remind them that I remember them too. Because that's who you are, Moses. You are the proof that my memory never fails. You are the proof that I keep my promises. You are the proof that when I say I will do, I will, for I am. And I made, and I am never, ever leaving you. What would you have done How would you have computed it? How would you have processed the reality of that story coming to bear down on your life? Moses had no option. He may have tried to argue. He may have wondered whether the magic tricks of a burning bush that doesn't seem to go on fire would be enough. And where he doubted magic, God promised wonders. He may have wondered whether this God would be able to empower him. And where he had doubt, God gave him a brother. God gave him family. But over and above everything that would happen from that point on, God made sure that he, that his brother, that the people remembered that they were remembered. Am I telling you that John is like Moses? Am I telling you that you are like Moses? Maybe it's for you to debate where this story fits into your life. Here's the thing I can tell you now, though. If Moses, in the midst of the direction that he was called to walk was told, you can do this if you remember me 
and you remember that I remember you, then this is a call that all of us share. For you see, the reality of this story as it bears an impact may not be that you are called to lead 605,330 young people to Christ. It bears then. Do you have room? (laughs) But it is a call for those of you who walk paths that you are uncertain of, who take journeys that you do not know what the outcome will be, who walk into the midst of works and callings that are bigger than you are on your own. It is a call for you to remember where you stand in that story. For if the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and the God of Moses is all the same God, and if they are all part of that story, then it can only mean one thing, that you and you and you and you are all a part of that same story. Their God is your God. And that God who makes promises, who says, I will lead my people. I will go into the places where you never dreamed of going. I will lead you into promises of milk and honey and blessing and of goodness. I, the God who say, I will never leave you. is your God too. So your story and your story is in that story. You think you know what's going on. You think you know your little circle of what is happening in the midst of life. You think that from wherever you have come from and whatever you do, you have your own little corner of what's going on in the gospel. Maybe that makes you feel better about it or maybe that keeps you from feeling nervous. I am here to tell you that your story is not yours. It is God's. And the power and the promise and the hope and the love and the deliverance and the salvation and all the different miracles and powers that go beyond your very imagination, they are all yours. And they are all yours. And it behoves you to remember but not simply to remember that you are bigger not simply to remember where you have come from not simply to remember the strides that you took on your own to get to the place that you find yourself in right now it behoves you to remember that all of this is only possible not because of your obedience not because of your say so not because you do anything incredible or special or that you have certain favors before God all of this is only possible because we believe in a God that promises He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never forget his promises to you. He will never forget to be faithful to you. He will never stop looking at you. He will never stop listening to you. He will never stop hearing your cry. He will never stop trying to find you a better path. He will never stop the work of trying to save the people even who do not know them. He will always remember all of the people of all of the world throughout history and out time. Your God remembers you. And if that's not enough for an ordination, then I don't know what is. (laughs) And so, in the name of the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob and of Moses and of Jesus and of John and of you. Remember. I should maybe have warned you that Ron tends to wander and gets quite passionate when he preaches. (laughs) What would it be like for our communities 
for our churches, for us here in Bearsden, if you're part of this church? How much would it make a difference to our community and our evangelism and our reaching out and our boldness if we remembered that God goes with us in all of it? That he's already out there working the ground for us. So Father God, let us go from this place with boldness, with courage, to spread the truth of your gospel, the truth of your love for us. Holy Spirit, fill each one of us. Let us be overflowing with your grace and your love, with your compassion and your mercy from this day forward, for all the days of our lives, wherever they may lead. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Feel free to grab a seat. Just a couple of things I wanted to tell you about as we draw our service to a close. First of all, I just wanted to thank you all again for being here this evening. Thank you to Michael and to the band. Thank you to Ron for preaching. Thank you, Martin, for coming on behalf of the national team. Thank you to John and to Craig and to Mark and to Jill for uh, everything you shared and for praying. And, and thank you to everyone for your ongoing prayers and support on this journey. Um, a few people have commented that I don't normally wear a jacket and it's slightly out of character. Just to bring it back into character, I'm going to tell you that I actually got this for eight pounds from a charity shop. <laughs> Still not quite in the Bear's Den way of doing things, but that's okay. Feel free to hang around for a little while. We've got, um, there's loads of, sorry? Well, they were a tenor, so. <laughs> but I was feeling flush that day, so I did buy them. They're just at home tonight. Maybe some other time. <laughs> we, have, we have lots of uh, cake. There's tea and coffee. Thank you to the folks who've been preparing that. Um, so please hang around, chat with one another, and have some time of fellowship. But thank you for being here, and God bless. Thank you.